Tanya Paws was just 13 when she left her mother Carol's house in California to spend the summer with her grandparents in Muncie, Indiana. A certified diver, Tanya decided on July 28, 1991, to go scuba diving in a quarry, which she had never done before. Tanya's watched me dive in this quarry, and she'd heard about all the things that were in the bottom of the quarry that you could see as a diver, and so she wanted to go down and see those things that she'd heard about for years. Tanya's grandparents, Dick and Miriam Handley, accompanied her that day. Bye, be careful. She's a sweet little girl. We're not on the same wavelength all the time, but that's to be expected. She knows we love her, and we know that she loves us. Sharon Catardis was a close friend of Tanya's mother. I arranged to have Sharon dive with her because she is an experienced diver. She is an assistant instructor. She knew the dive site well. We felt she would be the best person to have Tanya Buddy with. Car, you been in the water already? Yeah, it's I knew her uncle and her mom were very good divers, and she'd been on several dives in California and Florida. So I was pretty confident that she knew what she was doing. Visibility is not that great, and it is very cold. But when you're landlocked and there's not a beautiful ocean or anything else to go diving in, and you love to dive, you're going to go diving in what you have available. I was checking on Tanya, making sure everything was okay. She controlled her buoyancy very well, so she seemed pretty comfortable at that point. We had gotten down to about 30 feet. We're at the lowest temperature of the water is around 35, maybe. I turned and kind of wrapped my arms around and gave her that signal. And she gave me back, like, yes, it's colder down here. But at that time, I didn't take it that she was cold herself. So we went ahead and continued. I had a premonition that Tanya should not dive. And I felt so strongly about it that we called her mother and said, I just don't feel comfortable doing this. We don't want to have this responsibility. We had a lot of phone conversations back and forth. And I said, go ahead and let her. I'm giving her my permission. If anything happens, it'll be my fault. I won't blame you. At a certain point, she tugged on my fin. I turned around and looked at her and realized that she didn't have a regulator in her mouth. So I automatically gave her mine and then took my ex there. I looked over her shoulder and tried to find out what was wrong, where her regulator went to. And I saw that her tank had slipped out of her BC and was down quite far. But we were so close when we were buddy breathing together that I couldn't reach around her and pull up her tank. So I made the decision to come up and see if we can get it resolved at the surface. Next. I knew if I let go, then the air would have to go with me and she wouldn't have anything. like we weren't making any progress and I couldn't figure out why. At that point, I dropped her weight belt because I thought, well, maybe she had too much weight and that was one thing I can get rid of. We came up a little bit, but not very much. 
That was making me nervous because I was losing a little control of the situation. At that point, I dropped my weight belt, thinking that maybe I was overweighted. As I started to float towards the top, I was losing my grip on her because she wasn't coming up. I knew if I let go, then the air would have to go with me and she wouldn't have anything. All the air that I had in my suit and my VC just pulled me right up to the surface. As I stood on the shore looking out past the dock, I couldn't see any movement on the water itself, and then all at once, this helmet appeared. Call 911! Tony's on the bottom! Miriam! Call 911! I had everything working against me. I had no weight belt, I had all that buoyancy, and exhaling all my air is about the only thing I could do to help me get down and really fight and swim and kick to get back down to her. I was feeling guilty that I couldn't get her up to the surface safely the first time. She was just so still and she wasn't breathing. I just wanted to get her up and out of there. But if you come up too fast and you're not breathing, you could blow along very easily. Tanya had been underwater without air for nearly four minutes. When I looked at her, she just was very cold and very lifeless. I just hoped it wasn't too late. I came up on the dock and I looked over at Tanya and I said, my, my God, she's dead. And then I remembered this one instructor. He said, give him air, give him air, give him air. I was emotional and I knew I, I had to give her the air, at least give it a try. But I, I felt that we, she was gone. One, two, three, four, five. I was getting really scared because her color was blue. She wasn't responding to anything. Five, two, three, I was just four, sick to my stomach. Five. I was praying like crazy. Three. God, please, please, please don't let this girl die. What do I tell her mother? Three. This girl was her life. Five. One of the first rescue workers on the scene was Delaware County EMS paramedic, Mark Clark. When we checked her, she was in full arrest. We know what happened to somebody. Finding her coded was one of those that you go, we're behind the ball game here. And our primary concern is to do the CPR until we can get her heart started again and get her breathing. She's a systole. Tell me how far down you were. We were about 30 feet. When you're brought to the surface too quickly from a diving accident, air enters the bloodstream as a bubble, and that bubble can travel and cause a stroke. I've got a call. We needed to get her to the hospital just as quick as we could. 13-year-old Tanya Paz was taken by Parkview Samaritan Air Ambulance to St. Joseph Medical Center in Fort Wayne, Indiana. There, she was put under the care of Dr. Stephen Cole. Tanya at the scene had not only been hypothermic, meaning her body temperature had been low, she also had a collapsed a lung. But the reason she came to the hyperbaric facility was to deal with the bubbles in her bloodstream. 
Tanya spent five and a half hours in the hyperbaric chamber to regulate her oxygen levels and prevent deadly blood clots. It was almost unbelievable. It was like, like a small submarine. I tapped on the window. Then she turned her head. And then when she moved her finger back and forth against the window, that was, I thought, was like a prayer that had been answered. Four years have passed. Although she spent 11 days in the hospital, Tanya suffered no permanent injuries from the incident. I thought he only looked like 80. She did a lot of swimming before she did her dive, so she was lowering her body temperature without even realizing it before she went down into that cold water. It was too much to bear. I couldn't handle it. Tanya had become so disoriented by the cold, she didn't notice her regulator was caught. I didn't know anything about hypothermia then, so I've learned a lot. Yeah, that's good. She's a wonderful person. She has a very good outlook on life and how to handle things. And I'm just glad that I was there to help her and get her out of that situation. I try to tell Sharon how much I appreciate it, but it's hard for me. Because I don't want to think about myself almost dying. I can't even express how much... I'm happy to know her, unless she's a part of my life. I love her more than anything. I think Sharon, what she did was almost unbelievable, as far as physical strength. We have a lot of love for her. A lot of things. I have told Tanya that she must make something of her life because she has been given a second chance. And I feel that she must be very special to be given this chance. 